Hello and welcome to Analyzing Avatar, the late airbender. I am Dan and as always, I am joined by Chris, the late airbender himself. Whoop! Oh, oh, cheers, say hello, man. Chris. S- stop it. Stop it. Oh, <laughs> Hi, <you>. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Um, that joke was brought to you by the Big Book of Dad Jokes. Uh, <laughs> um, this week, we took a look at an episode called The Puppet Master. Now, I'm going to put my cards on the table here and say this is genuinely one of my favorite episodes of the show. Full stop. So, mm. to, present, to, prevent, present, to prevent me from just spending the next you know, hour or so gushing... Um, I'm, I'm going to try to restrain myself a little bit because I think everything about this episode is basically perfect. But we'll come back to that. Um, this is the episode, for those who don't remember, where Katara and uh, the gang, particularly Katara, discover um, a town where people have been going missing. They also meet a, a sort of strange old lady who has some sort of secret um, called Hammer. Um, it turns out the secret is she's actually sort of the water tribe and she's a waterbender. Um... The, 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 when there's a full moon, people are going missing. Her powers clearly increased by the full moon. Katara, so smitten, she quite simply doesn't put it together, um, which is kind of amazing, um, but also like makes perfect sense in the context of the way the episode is written. Um, eventually, she discovers that the reason that people are going missing is because Hammer uh, has a skill called bloodbending, which is one of those many things we've talked about, uh, you know, where, where, the, where there's the initial skill, waterbending, and then a thing you can do beyond that. Like me- like earthbenders being able to do metal bending if they get good enough. Um, it's an incredible thing. A uh, very dark idea. Extremely creepy um, and upsetting as an episode. Um, it did air as their Halloween episode that year. Um, aired in you know like October twenty fifth. I want to say yes, October twenty fifth. I checked. I, I did. I was I was trying to check it earlier, but I I couldn't quite get the date. But yeah, it aired in October. Um, so yeah, it's sp- 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 spookiest, spooky, 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 spooky episode. Um, in the end, um, to to defeat Hammer, Katara has to bloodbend herself, making her uh, almost as 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 bad as the thing she was she was fighting against. It's a, and, and the episode just ends on her sobbing, which is just really dark. Um, so wh- what do we think, Chris? Uh, because if, if if we're not careful, I will gush forever. Oh, I loved it. I thought it was incredibly creepy, in- incredibly, mm. uh, such a terrifying, creepy idea, but also so incredibly logical. I, d- I have a question for you, Dan. Did did we, because we forgot last week to discuss, and I thought it watching the episode, the the, the notion of Katara making sweat and using that to escape. Um, yes. We didn't discuss that. No, that and I was great. inherently like, Ooh, like like watching it. I don't know why. I'm a very sweaty person, you know. So I don't I don't have a problem with sweat. But yeah. But did did you deliberately not discuss it? Because obviously that sort of thematically comes back this week. Or did we just fuck up a little and forget to discuss that? Well, I I was quite happy to discuss it if you brought it up. But I, I deliberately didn't bring it up. I was I because yeah, yeah. I didn't want to I didn't want to highlight because it is it's it's a really good bit of foreshadowing. Because what a smart yes. way to introduce a concept before it becomes very relevant because it it really feels in in the context of the episode like it just belongs in that episode and is just doing what it's doing on the surface which is being a really interesting and cool way for her to use her powers to escape right like it, it it's what, the best kind of foreshadowing is when the foreshadowing doesn't feel like foreshadowing because it's actually doing something else anyway you know, if we just established she could do that and it wasn't really used for anything, you'd go, well, they're setting that up for something later. But making it a part of that episode's plot is very, very clever. And yeah, absolutely. I, I, I made a, I sort of made a decision that like, I wouldn't bring it up. If you did, we'll talk about it and we'll just talk about it in that way. But if I worried that if I highlighted it, you might have only thought of it as being a passing thing and might have gone maybe Dan's brought that up for a reason and I was trying to uh, right, anticipate right, right. that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it, you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a good part of the previous episode and, uh, and, a, and a great genius bit of setup for this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just all... And it's, you know, we talked about that notion before, you know, metal bending uh, in particular. Um, it's mm-hmm. the same thing, but for earth bending. And I... 
Yes, yeah, I mean it's fantastic. It's 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 such a it's such a bold, creepy idea to do in a in a children's animation. But they do exactly the right line of it. They don't, uh, you know, the the balance of that. You know, this this could be an eighteen rated horror movie, um, but they do a really good job of 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 not going too far with that. Um, but still getting the full horror and the body horror of it across the the position it leads Katara in is stunning. Like uh, what a, uh, such an in depth, um, deep, uh, horrific thing to do with a character. So mm. interesting, so interesting, so phenomenally interesting. The to have to turn her into the villain to stop the villain. Um, mm-hmm. fantastic, but also doing it to to stop uh, Ang and Sokka and and that notion of um, you know, I even like the idea of you know, because the the woman had to <laughs> she had to learn to do it on rats over years, and Katara can just suddenly do it. But I like the notion that she could suddenly do it because Ang, the two people she cares about most in the world. <laughs> are about to kill each other like so she's right. you know she's in that moment that heightened emotional state just able to really focus her power and do it um which is again a just a really interesting idea mm-hmm. um i love how powerful katara is i think it's perfectly paced it's perfectly executed all the bits are the right way you begin to you begin to realize um you well i don't think you're ever not suspicious of her but right. you 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 sort of get to holy shit it's blood bending before they say it um even if it's not specifically blood bending actually i i'm giving myself too much credit there i i assumed she was bending the water that is naturally in the body you know mm-hmm. um i guess not really having i suppose if i'd have thought about that if someone had questioned me on it i'd have you know in a couple of questions have got to blood but i just kind of like you know the body's full of water so i assumed it was uh, i assumed it was that but i you get to it in a really i don't that's not a criticism some things people t- all too often are like oh i worked it out before before we saw it sometimes you meant to because the horror of it especially in a horror scenario right. uh, the horror of it is creeping up on you at the same time its momentum is building and it's creeping up on the characters and that's uh, that's a really effective thing um yeah so yeah i'm with you yeah let's gush away yeah, well, I think the other clever thing to do with this episode is make it a mystery. Because I, because I, I, okay, so slight spoilers is a weird pull, but a slight spoilers for season one of twenty four. <laughs> um, twenty four does this brilliant thing in its first season where there's a character where they suspect the character of being an antagonist of some sort. I'm not going to go into the details to try and stop it from being a full on spoiler. Really early on. And the character manages to prove they are not. And explain the suspicious behaviour. And by having the characters question that character, and having them demonstrate that's not the case, as a viewer, you then become more accepting of that character. And then when the reveal at the end of the season is that it was them, and that they actually play, played a blinder, it's very powerful. It really hits you. Now, this isn't as good as that, because as Chris points out, you pretty much are always suspicious of Hammer to some degree. What I think's brilliant about this episode is, though, when it starts, it's so clearly this something is up with this creepy lady. When you hear her story, they suspect her, and then she explains, yeah, I do have a secret. You're right. I have to keep you something from you. It's that I'm actually Southern Water Tribe hiding out in the Fire Nation. There is a minute or two where you think they could go that route where she's innocent. You really do mm. believe it. And while it then, as she starts teaching Katara stuff, starts to go back the other way, which is intentional, I think. They start ramping up that tension again. And again, Katara so willing to overlook those things. Because I think in another, in a weaker, in a, poor, uh, yeah, a poorer written episode, you'd maybe st- struggle to understand why Katara doesn't put it together. People going missing at the full moon. Hammer being a waterbender more powerful at the full moon. It just seems, and she even says, you know, Katara's like, we shouldn't be out at the full moon. And Hammer's like, oh, that won't be a problem. Don't worry about it. I think we'll be just fine. And it's just like, well, wait a minute. (laughs) Why is that? Why are you so confident of that? And it's like, any other episode, you'd go, why did Katara not understand or see that? But in this episode, 
we make it very clear that Katara is seeing what she wants to see in Hammer, and that's her grandmother. You know, her her mm. heritage, her her you know her own history laid out in front of her, a link to her mother. You know, it's it's so many things to Katara, and to then turn that so sour and into something so horrible. It's just, it's just genius writing, like on all levels. So, but the, yeah, they, so they use that twenty four trick really well to give you a moment of doubt with Hammer before they then drive the nail in. Um, but it also allows them to explore by having it be so obvious. We actually get to understand a little more about Katara and how she's seeing this because I think you know if it was hidden better, you maybe wouldn't take that away from the episode. You know, Katara smittenness. But because it's so blatant, particularly when she takes her out into the field and is drawing water from the flowers, like, yeah, it really gives the game away, I think, that whole sequence. Um, but yeah, turning it into a mystery in general and having, like, you know, while Katara's going through all that, the rest of them, you know, poking around. And also giving us a second possibility that it could be a spirit, which we've seen. How many towns have they gone to where there's a spirit and it's because they're trashing the local ecosystem and the spirit's angry? Mm. it's happened you know makes perfect sense they do give you an alternate explanation that does fit what's what, what we're hearing you know but so also, having them the, off investigating that is another great use of their time but also from the writing another amazing thing about the writing is <laughs> from from the villain's point of view i can't remember what's her name sorry hammer hannah from hannah's point of view ha- ha- hammer with an m in the middle Shh. Hammer. From Hammer's point of view, Hannah or Hammer. Hammer. H A M A. Hey, Hannah, right. Uh, mm-hmm. From Hannah's point of view, it's not like she's hiding something or she's she's not the villain from her point of view. Right. <laughs> like she she fully believes what she's doing, she believes her reasoning, and you know, if that if Katara is like, Yeah, okay, this is a great idea, she's revealing she's revealing what she's done to her within seconds of that forest scene. If, you know, Katara just immediately is on her side. Um, Mm -hmm. so she's not even, it's not like she's keeping this big secret or has this dastardly plan because in her head, it's not that in her head, it is absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah. It's obviously fucking not. Katara is going to turn around and be like, yeah, that's a great idea. We should keep doing this. Yeah. Which is why at the end, I I don't even think in her head, the villain loses because she doesn't because she, she convinces in her head. She has influenced someone who she knows is more powerful to her than her to do the same thing and potentially take it forward. Yeah, set her on a path to become, you know, like she is and and, Mm. and use that technique against the Fire Nation that ripped her from her home. And again, we're in that world of this story because it's doing so fucking much. Also another example of like, the characters like Jet back in the day, going right back to season one and several of the characters since just blindly being like fire nation bad. Yeah. 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 Uh, So we're again at this, this idea of, Hey, guess what? Not everyone that lives in a country that's government or leadership is doing terrible things. He's a bad person inherently. It's not how war works. (laughs) Um, I think you could have got a really cool, you know, spider-man 2 train sequence moment where in order to save them you know there's some over air bending or earth bending and these fire nation people kind of realize ang's the avatar or realize that there's earth benders and water benders in the mix and they look at the gang and go you freed our town we will keep your secret and, you know yeah. they literally have that represented shown in the episode by you know having these fi- the Fire Nation people there go, we're not going to turn you in because we recognise what you've done for us. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, and and I think it's a, it is a good idea. I just I would worry that it would maybe take away from the Katara of this episode because I, I like yeah, yeah, that the only yeah, yeah. person that the, the, the episode focuses on is her. Uh, really, you know, the, 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 it's very supplemental that Sokka, Ang, and Toph are off looking for the you know for the for for hammer's victims the people she's she's sort of forced to you know she's kidnapped by making them Mm. you know essentially walk themselves into captivity which is kind of insane um when that guy describes what happens to him as well the the first guy they meet so upsetting Mm. the notion but yeah um you're right right. I, i would like to see that ang scene but i don't know if this is the episode to do it in. does that make sense yeah that's fair yeah 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 
I think because I think you're exactly right. That that's a really cool idea to give Ang that moment, and they kind of could have done it at the Painted Lady, but again, that's an episode of that's a Katara based episode, and you you've really got to find, find a, like a an Ang centric episode to do that in. I think. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Um, that's that's fair, and also, it's no, no, you're right. Slightly... The perfect opportunity did arise here. It's just it's a shame the episode isn't focused on him. And I kind of like the fact that they almost don't. It would also undermine her point. And I, she's obviously not right, but I like the idea that they don't undermine her point. You do, you do understand her logic, even if you don't agree with it, as in Hannah's logic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hannah's kind of a. She, yeah, she's she's a she, she's a uh, one of those really good antagonists that's like completely understandably wrong. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. it's 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 you totally get how she got there. You don't agree with her or her methodology, yeah, but you you get how she got there. And even like you're right that the, what's so good about this episode is essentially the bad guy wins. You know, she wanted someone to carry on that legacy, you know, uh, of this horrible technique, this bloodbending. And, you know, um, and, and you know, here we are. Like, it's she's she succeeded. She's taught someone how to do it. Uh, and that person sh- showed themselves willing to do it in extraordinary circumstances, sure. But, yeah, it's, it's a win. Uh, and it's worth talking about that as well. Hammer's creative fighting style um and th- that entire moonlit battle between her and katara that ends with um her having soccer and ang flying towards each other with blood bending soccer with his sword outstretched about to you know pierce ang's chest basically that's like a really one very dark idea for this show <laughs> number one literally trying to make soccer kill ang um but two like what a creative use of the of the technique! Like they didn't hold back. There's, you know, no, not at it, all. they could have just kept it with the bit they did before, where it's a bit of light hearted. Like Sokka tries to swing his sword at Katara, and she like freezes him to a tree, and he's like, "I'm so sorry." She's like, "It's okay." <laughs> you know, they could have just kept it at that, which is fun and a, a reasonably interesting use of it. But the way they force her into it, it's just ah, it's so good. This this fucking episode. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. It's fantastic. Like, uh, because it, even, like, I really enjoyed the the comical... Because, you know, the soccer stuff, like you say, is sort of played for jokes. Um, mm-hmm. But I got a real kick out of, like, <laughs> her being, like, when she um, ices Ang to the tree. And she's like, sorry, Ang! And he's like, it's okay! <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Just really yeah, yeah, fun. Yeah. It's, 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 it's really good. It's really well done. And I think this episode does have some good comedy in it as well. Like, that moment's like that, or... Like there's some there's some stuff with like uh, the, the sea prunes, which is a little reference to um, a reference to when I think it's Botto of the Water Tribe, when Ang gets to taste some traditional Southern Water Tribe food, and he hates it, and then he Toph, who hasn't had the the pleasure yet, Ang like whispers like, "Don't touch the sea prunes." <laughs> He's like, yeah. "Trust me, I've done it. I've learned. Mm-mm. <laughs> These guys love it." It ain't the one. Um, I think that's quite fun. Oh, I also love the brilliant joke of um, you know, Toph suggesting the moon spirit is 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 the is, is the cause because obviously it's yes. happening during the full moon. <laughs> and Sokka getting all defensive. The moon spirit is a gentle, loving lady. <laughs> that's a brilliant yeah. moment. <laughs> Yeah. Where so but so I guess the interesting and obviously you know, but let's let's talk retroactively about when you first watched this. Yes. Because I'm like, you know, it's it's essentially a power that in a, in certainly in a one to one battle combat gives Katara the upper hand, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then some. Um, but I don't think, you know, do, do, were you thinking? Are they going to force her to use it again? If they force her to use it again, is it not going to be just this moment again, but on a sort of bigger scale? Mm. And that notion of is it like fire bending for Ang, where he's just like, it, I can't. It's not worth the. It's not worth the the inhumanity that it, that is caused when I do it. It, it. What were your thoughts on where it went? 
Because my mine, uh, not to ask you a question and answer for myself, but no, no, I think it's, it's, you your answer is more think... interesting, I think, than mine because you're you're actually in a position to speculate. Like I've, I've got to be careful. I, I I can state what I vaguely remember my feelings on it were, but I think it'll be more interesting to hear from yourself anyway. So yeah, feel free to answer that question because I think you're. I think that I, is I the... feel like it's not going to play into the end, but it will play into the next few episodes. I feel like they're going to do some. You know, mm-hmm. Katara is not in a good place over the next few episodes. Like the storyline when Appa goes missing and Aang's not in a good place. I think they're mm-hmm. going to do that sort of thing with Katara. Um, I don't think it will come into play in any kind of other battles. Um, but I think it'd be cool if it did. Um, but they've got to be careful with it. Because like I say, this is the right storyline. Obviously, morally, <laughs> it's the right storyline to do with it. But also, narratively, it's the right storyline to do with it. Because mm. then you just... Otherwise, you just have Katara kicking ass every time she's in a fight. <laughs> yeah, that's the other, that's the thing. Is like They very much established this as like a... This is like almost an... Take a shot, Harry Potter reference. This is an unforgivable curse. You know, this is, this is mm. one of the things you should not be using. Um, and I, the, you know, a small criticism I've always had for the Harry Potter books is that they set that up, and you know, in the in in the earlier books as being a you know like particularly Gobbler, these things you don't do, they're horrible, and then they use them a good couple of times in the last books on the enemy without really ever challenging that that's probably the wrong thing to do. Like when they when they break into Gringotts in the final books or Mild Harry Potter, Harry Potter spoilers, they just they just take they're, they're bloodbending everyone. <laughs> Because <laughs> the Harry Potter universe mm. has its own version of bloodbending, and and, and 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 I'm just like, we're not going to challenge this at all. Um, so I guess from my perspective, when I first watched it, my vague memory of how I felt was, if they do choose <laughs> to use it again, we better be doing it when we can, we can have. The, deal with the consequences of it so let's say there's a katara yeah. episode of some sort you know between now and the end of the series that's the episode where you can challenge that notion you can't do it in the final battle because you're not going to have the time to have katara emotionally explore that and what that but- means that she's had to resort to that again um yeah but that would be the same scene we've just seen in a way wouldn't it would you, oh like her using it and then reacting yeah her using it and then dealing with you know we we've just seen that i kind of don't i'm happy to see the fallout of this i'd quite like to see that but to have her kind of have her fallout get over it and then do it on mm. zuku zuko um zuko and then react the same way that she's just reacted to doing it on hannah wouldn't, yeah, it'll be, it'll be the same problem we that. had with the last Toph episode, which is that it didn't really cover any new ground. Yeah, no, I agree. I do agree with that. I'm just saying, if you're going to bring it back, that's the you you if you if she's ever going to use blood bending again, it absolutely cannot be done without some sort of reaction or understanding yes, yeah. of what she's doing. Because my my issue with the Harry Potter series is that they seem to drop all pretense that that's a those those particular curses are like unforgivable in some way. That's that's what yeah. bothers me is that the characters don't even acknowledge that it's a hard thing to do and that there's some sort of difficulty in having to make the choice to use those. They just do yes, it yeah, completely unchallenged. So my what I guess what I was coming to is if the idea of bloodbending is either going to be she never does it again because she thinks it's evil, which is totally fair enough way for the show to handle it, um, or she's forced to again but if they do do that it's gonna have to be forced and she's gonna have to acknowledge that she made a difficult choice there you can't just yes, ignore I agree. it 100% can't yeah, ignore it even if you're agree. hitting the same beat you still have to justify it it has to be like it has to be like Sokka's life's in danger her life's in danger right. there's she's she's on the floor they look at each other you know a look that says you have to and then she kicks some ass with blood bending and the fire nation are like because oh, as horrific as an idea as it is there's some spectacular like visuals you could do with it and like that moment where the firebenders realized what what's happening would mm-hmm. be stunning um so yeah i i completely agree Mm. It's, it's and you kind of as has... much as like as much as sorry to interrupt as much as i don't want her to have the emotional pain 
of having to do it. I do kind of want to see the fire tribe's reaction to it. <laughs> right, yeah, they like sort of get the, the I want to see fire nation it's... soldiers almost afraid of 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 Katara the way you'd be afraid of a monster. Like the yeah, the idea of them reacting it's... to her like like a mo- uh, being a monster having you know, having done it. Uh, yeah, that's it. You're right. That's a, that's it. The... You know, have her be- almost become the villain from their perspective and yeah, that's a, that's yeah, a, that's and, a really and good thinking idea. about it, it, it's not even Zuko; it's Azula. Do you know I you, the Azula Katara fighting, and Azula thinking she's got the upper hand, and then Katara producing that move mm-hmm. is sort of the is if if we're going to see it again, that's how I want to see it. Because Zuko Zuko's you know de- de- uh, conflicting, dealing with his own stuff. The Fire Lord, you just want you just want him and Ang. Do you know what I mean? I don't think that that, that means much. But uh, Katara and Azula have fought before. Um, they've had their fights and stuff, and and Azula's you know cocky as anything. And the notion of them fighting again and her producing that is yeah is 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 a good one. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hundred percent agree, hundred percent agree. I guess there's a version of the story where you go down where like, like, like when Katara Darth Vader's her way through a Fire Nation submarine or something, you know, like from the scene from the end of Rogue One. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where everyone's just running for their lives, <laughs> Katara's just like <laughs> fucking everyone up. But um, uh, I think you'd have to get her into a very different place emotionally to get away with a thing like that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah, I, I I I genuinely think it's one of the the best episodes of the show. Um, and I and 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 a, and a big big old thumbs up to Tress McNeil, who who I generally who I mostly just know from being in like doing Simpsons and Futurama. I don't really, you know, uh, I'm I don't really know what like what else she's famous for. Really, I only really know recognize her voice from. Oh no, she's an anima- Animaniacs as well. She's 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 thingy, isn't she, for Animaniacs? I think. I have no idea. Anyway, Tress McNeil's voice I, I, I love, and I think she's um, a really good choice here. Um, I don't think... she's, a, she's a, She'd be a hard actress to, to uh, figure into this show in any other way because she's a very distinct voice. Only fits... She's very... She is versatile, but she does also, like, in a show like this that's a bit more naturalistic, you, you, you're a bit more restricted in what kind of characters you can have her voice, and I think this is a really great use for her. Um... Big, big old fan. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I think she was really effective, and she was effective at playing both sides. You know, there were moments where you thought mm, maybe she's a good yeah. guy, um, and I think a lot of that is down to the the voice acting as as well as the script and stuff. Yeah, she, oh yeah, she. I checked. She is Dot from Animaniacs. I thought so. Um, yeah, no, she's 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 a very good actress, and I think you're right exactly that because you've got to really sell. You've got to sell that moment in the middle. When you think there's a possibility, how I might just be of another victim of the Fire Nation trying to get by, you know, which is which is still technically true, even when we find out the rest of her story. But you know, you know, completely innocent, not hurting anyone. Uh, you know, there's, you've got to be able to sell me on on that version of it too. And like the the the, the, the show the show does that, um, yeah, definitely quite well. But it's not just through the writing though, through through her performance, as you pointed out. Um, yeah. I also love. I just want to the, the quote that I really love and the way she delivers it. It's the "do what you must to survive" thing. Mm. Like when she says that, it's very, very telling of her whole attitude. But it's said in such a great way. So yeah, um, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, I feel, I feel like we've covered it, which is weird. We've covered it in like record time. <laughs> yeah, this but is it's what because it's when there's nothing. But no, it's. Ex- yeah, it's what we've said multiple times. When the episode is just fantastic, you're just naming great scenes from it. Um, do you? No, it's just awesome. I got nothing. <laughs> I like. I like that <laughs> Ang and Sokka went back. Um, that made a lot of sense, and Toph stayed to sort of help the people that she was right. saying all along were were there. I, I, well, um, yeah, I really like well, that. a little poke there in just that the the once again. Toph being very overpowered because if it had been the other way round, the fight would have ended. And I know that's why we did it that way. I understand, but uh, Toph would have 
flattened Hammer in a second. Like, it wouldn't have been a fight. <laughs> like, not that's... If Hannah, not if Hannah realised she was there. In, and then um, had a chance to blood bend Toph before Toph could I guess. bring a load of well, rock then, Oh, then in that case, Katara's dead. <laughs> like, Toph is, Toph is the lapis of this show. We mostly have to get her out of the way because she's too powerful for her own good. <laughs> Why don't I, Let's dig into that then. Because I, for me, the reason Katara could... Uh, for me... Because it's the same power against each other, because yeah. they have the same skills against each other, mm-hmm. but Katara is younger and 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 they're both masters, but Katara is a master at, at sort of approaching the peak of her powers, whereas right. Hannah, by her own admission, is you know getting older and and that's going away a bit. That's why Katara can face off against her because. Toph has a different power so I don't think I can see your argument of well you could argue the same about Katara I don't think you can because Katara's got the same power and that's why she's able to overthrow it whereas I think Toph would be more easily controlled by Hannah because it's a different power yeah that again that assumes Hannah sees her coming Whereas I feel like I, yes, she, yeah, 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 know, but that was yeah. that was the that was the parameters in which I was talking about it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I think you know, if, if Toph's just arriving on the scene, like <laughs> hammers in earth, handcuffs and in a box, immediately trapped and unable to move and therefore unable to bend. Like it's, Ang, you know what I mean? Like but she, Ang can, she's Ang flattening can bend her earth. in like two point three seconds. You know, but how come Ang couldn't take her on then? Well, I mean, we we do you remember that episode when they go to see the Earth King and the um, the whole Earth Nation army like show up and Toph just flies through them all. <laughs> like Toph just wipes them yeah, all yeah. out in like three moves. Uh, Ang helps, but he's not quite what Toph is in terms. It's a, it's, you know what it is for Toph. It's her reaction times. It's her speed. It's her because she can feel the, te- the the vibrations through the floor. If Toph's approaching that situation and she starts to feel Hammer turning towards her, she's picking that up way ahead of Ang. She's mm-hmm. she's yeah, already yeah. got she's so- already got Hammer squished between two rocks. Or thrown into the yeah. air, or whatever the fuck she wants. <laughs> she's she's an extraordinary uh, combatant in a world where, in a world where all of these techniques require movement, like they they have they do a series of moves to physically bend any element. You know, uh, it's even if it's just like a swish of the arm or whatever. You can never, you know, no one's earth bending completely stood still in this show. So. Toph's at a massive advantage at all times because she sees what you're about to do before you do it and just will disable you. It's just she'll just she'll just you know <laughs> cover you in rock. Like I, I, I guess her biggest uh, potential challenge is another uh, Earthbender. I guess. Um, but yeah, I feel like I feel like sometimes in this show they do keep Toph out of the way for that reason. <laughs> That's, I, there's, there's a couple of times yeah, we that mentioned or, that. That or a wooden cell. Yeah, yeah. She's she's basically, um, and we've already mentioned Harry Potter this week, so take a shot, Doctor Who time. She's a sonic screwdriver. She doesn't work on wood. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So she does. She does have a. She's not all power. I don't think it's fair to say she's she's all powerful. You can no, easily write but a she scenario. Is, she is. Where, ex- yeah, but she's yeah. Ex- she, unless you've happened to have a wooden cell nearby and have prepared for her. You, you know, you're probably in trouble. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, most um, definitely. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. I find I know I find that interesting, and, and and not not a major criticism because it's like one of them stays to help. That's fine. Like, it doesn't matter which one. It's 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 you know I wouldn't have had it. The one way round that doesn't. Well, actually, it's the way round that makes the most sense because of course Ang and Sokka both have their feelings for Katara. Uh, Sokka obviously has it. It's his sister. And, you know, he loves her deeply. Ang obviously has his feelings for yeah. Katara. Whereas Toph, uh, who does like Katara and gets on with Katara well enough, isn't like, it's not the same, is it? But she's definitely the one that's likely to stay behind in that scenario. For me, it's not about it's not about Toph's feelings for Katara because I think they'd, uh, they'd all do anything for each other. I think it's right. more about, they do a, another, another kind of subtle thing that this episode does brilliantly is Toph right from the off 
is saying these people are there and there's a problem here. So it's not about Toff's feelings for Katara. It's about Toff's commitment to helping these people that she's been, had a feeling were there and trapped all along. So I don't think it's, I think in Toff's head, two people are in trouble and need help here. And she's, she's got a real emotive leaning towards those. And she knows that, you know, Ang and Ang Ang and Sokka are going to go, um, going to go for Katara regardless of what else happens. So right. she's freeing them, and then and then you know she turns, and then when they're all free, the first thing she does is turn up to where Katara's in trouble. Too bloody late, guess me. <laughs> <laughs> Too late for your standards, but tough. But, but you, 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 you're you're my favourite, but you're letting the side down. You know. <laughs> You're letting this. I letting think you're just side. looking for things to nitpick at Toff, so you don't seem too biased. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are you doing, Toff? Getting there just after the story needed you to be there. <laughs> well, actually, no. The story very much needed you to not be there. So, I mean, just after the characters needed you to be there. Um, so, uh, with that said, should we, should we just get straight onto the triv? Yeah, man. Let's triv it up. Um, I'm actually going to nip to the loo while you start the triv, Dan. Oh wow. So I Chris really isn't. Chris the... really isn't bothering with the truth this week. That's fine. It's uh... no, no, no. It's because it's because I had I had I had two drinks in front of me. We've done two episodes today. I had two week, two drinks in front of me for the first episode. Didn't drink one of them because I was like, well, I don't want to break the podcast and need to pee. And then in the break, whilst we watched this episode, downed a pint of. <laughs> but didn't <laughs> yourself then go to the toilet? <laughs> Meaning I now, and as I was downing it, Dan, I was thinking, hmm. This might lead to me needing to pee during the next episode, um, but I instead did it of anyway. peeing in the break, Be- yeah, but I did it anyway because I'm just that I'm just that kind of guy. Mm. Mm. Anyway, um, so apparently this episode was conceptualized with the title "Dark Side of the Moon." Um, uh, apparently, there was a book called Sozin's Comet: The Final Battle, and on one of the pages, it actually references this episode as being called that. Um, I don't know anything about that book, but um, apparently, the book was in production. Uh, was, was sort of was being developed alongside the production of this, and that's why it ends up giving the the the, the wrong name. Uh, it's what it is. It's fine. It's not the first time we've had an alternate title for one of these episodes due to something like that. So, not 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 really an issue. Uh, when Katara remarks that Hammer reminded her um, of her own grandmother, apparently she's holding a cabbage that looks like uh, her, her nana's face. Um, I. I hope that's not true, just because that's weird, and I don't know why you would write that into the episode. Imagine putting that like in a script, like she's thinking of her grandmother. Coincidentally, the cabbage she's holding happens to look like her grandmother. What? Like, I don't, why would you choose to do that? Um, I think I can hear Chris going back. I am curious as to his reaction to the cabbage. Um, I think he's maybe washing washing hands. I'm a, I'm allowed to relay his reaction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Chris has pointed out um, off mic uh, that he, you know that, that an animator that, that that could have been also just been a thing an animator added like a rogue animator that was just like oh this would be funny she's talking about her uh, about her grandmother we'll, we'll get the face in in a cabbage um, yeah this is considered to be one of the darkest episodes of the series um, this was a Halloween special released in October that year um, it has many of the conventional elements of a horror film. That is absolutely true. Um, The episode called into question whether the Avatar receives a boost to his or her power during um, a full moon or other elemental thing like waterbenders do. So, obviously, we've seen in the past that firebenders will get power from a comet. Earthbenders, uh, sorry, waterbenders get power from the moon. You know, extra power, I should say. And therefore, certain celestial situations like something like an eclipse can drain a, a firebender of their firebending. And you know, uh, we we you know we saw that the moon sort of spirit being destroyed took away the waterbenders waterbending. In this episode, Ang doesn't seem any extra powerful, whereas Katara very much does under the moonlight, and it kind of makes you question whether the Avatar is affected in either way, positive or negative, by those elemental factors. So yeah. Interesting I thought. I don't, I don't. I don't really have a thought on it, unfortunately. Um, but it's an interesting thought. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I, yeah, hundred um, percent. Let's see. 
Um, why is this in the trailer? See, I did call the trivia, but I only had a few minutes to do it because obviously we we, we watched this episode between recordings. Uh, we only had like that time. Um, this is the second and final time that we see Toph blushing. Thanks, trivia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, in Hammer's oh, flashback, Christ. one of the villagers surrounding um, uh, surrounding them is, is is similar in appearance to Toph. There's a young boy that has a warrior's wolf tail hairstyle, like Sockers, and um, Katara's uh, grandmother is sporting hair loopies like Katara's, which is nice. I think that's a nice little reference. That's fine. See, I think I think it was all the same animator and. Uh, and someone came up to him and they were like, oh, that looks um, that looks a little bit like visually, that's a little reference to, to Toph, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, no, it is. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's really good, really good subtle stuff. Um, you should do more of that. And he's like, oh, okay. And then uh, he comes back and he's like, I've done more of that. <laughs> and they're like, oh, brilliant. What have you done? I've made the cabbage look like, uh, look like a mum. <laughs> like what? <laughs> oh, dear. Um, this is the only episode in book three that has the previous on Avatar section have clips from book one. I didn't say I caught the end. when you skip it on Netflix. Sometimes it shows you the tail end, so I caught the the sweat stuff. Um, but I didn't see. Yeah. I didn't I'm see glad you do because I think stuff. I think it's it's too much about the moon and water bending powers, and it, I think it does actually spoil the episode a little bit. Um, this episode was included in a digital compilation that Nickelodeon put together called Nicktoons Spooky Halloween. Um, it was a digital compilation you could buy on iTunes in 2009 and it included various Halloween episodes of their shows. Um, this yes, episode was included. I, Makes sense? I imagine out of context, this episode works a dream. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, was, I wondered about that very briefly. Because part of me goes, absolutely no, this wouldn't work out of context. But part of me goes, I, I guess the core ideas are mostly set up in this episode. Yeah, but not what, what, what not what bending is. Not <laughs> oh these yeah, right. Are. I guess yeah. Not... I'm assuming a base level knowledge of the show. You're absolutely right. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the uh, this is one of the few episodes Ang doesn't bend a single element. Doesn't bend at all. Yeah, yeah. That is, see, that's much. That's that's fine. You know, that's much better than Toth blushes <laughs> for the second and final time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, um, are you ready, Chris? I'm ready. For a listener question. Oh, right, yeah, sorry, that was the end of the trip. Yes, no, I'm absolutely ready for a, a, a listener question. Um, oh, I swear, do, we, do we need to sum up that we liked the episode? We do do that, but this one was so clearly a good, positive review that I don't know if we... Because normally at the yes, end no, we yes, go, fantastic. great episode, really enjoyed it, blah 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 but... Or whatever yeah, the review no, is. Uh, it was brilliant stuff. Yes. So listener question now if you would like to leave us a question to answer an episode of this podcast you're welcome to do so you can do it by going to patreon.com slash nothing but static and for as little as one dollar a month you get both access to brand new episodes of this one week in advance at least for the remainder of this series which admittedly isn't much longer but there you go uh, if you want to hear next, next week's episode right now you can do that um but yeah we, we we also allow you to ask questions um and we have a question this week from we Wait, put we put we do put our other show we put rewind reviews up a week early as well don't we we do we do so yeah if you're also yeah. listening to rewind reviews then you know you can take advantage um and also the question asking thing which is pretty good i think <laughs> um so we have a question from punkfish um who has said <laughs> this is a good so I, I i took a bunch of these down and like i've scrambled the order a bit because i was just they were you know obviously some people asked multiple questions i didn't want someone to get two questions in one week after the other or whatever so i just mixed all the questions up so i'm just pulling random ones at this point um I, <laughs> this is a good one suppose you two could switch bodies for a day what would you want to do with that or what no, would you want to do that and what would you do with the day so let me get the boring version of the answer out of the way first no i wouldn't want to do that that sounds like a nightmare situation just in general for a million and one reasons uh, the boring answer is immediately alert jess to the situation if i've woken up and i'm in chris's bed i'm immediately alerting everyone to all the situations um i'm not showering because i'm respecting chris's privacy i'm hoping not that i don't need a pee all day i'm just i'm doing everything to try and that's the boring realistic answer the fun answer is i'm fucking up everything on purpose for my own amusement 
<laughs> like, I, I'm waking up and being like, hey, bitch face, make me a sandwich. <laughs> That's the first thing I'm saying. That I'm going into work and being like, hey, dickhead. <laughs> I'm, I'm boss man. Do what I say. Go clean the floor or the toilet or something. And just like, be an asshole all day for fun. Because there's no consequences on me. Because the next day, I'm super generally, I'm back in my own body. <laughs> So yeah, I'd sleep with Nadia. Um, moving on. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I am joking. Um, I uh, <laughs> I would do that for for all the reasons Dad has outlined. Yeah, um, I mean, look, the realistic I, answer is the first one: is anything I can do to be respectful, alert people to the situation. Yeah, that's the honest thing. I, but, but you know, if, is, I, if, I'm, if you, no one wants that answer, so the fun answer is just be an asshole to everyone and ruin Chris's life in as many ways as I physically can in the time that I have. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's very sweet of uh, very sweet of Dan to to say that he wouldn't go to the toilet. You know, just as, as trust me, Dan, you could avoid seeing my my my, my, my bits by just uh, by just positioning yourself in a way that my belly sticks out a little bit more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other thing I thought about is like maybe it could do like if I desperately needed to pee, I could like if I go outside, like find a wooded like a, a, a wood area, and then I can then I've yeah. not got the fear of missing the toilet bowl with the, I could probably do it with my eyes closed. Would feel like yeah. the respectful way. There, there, there are so many logistical issues these body swap movies never deal with. I want someone to make like an eighteen plus body swap movie, like a, like an R rated body swap movie, so we can actually deal with how people would genuinely have to solve those kinds of problems. <laughs> well, especially because like there's so much logistical issues, isn't there? Like even like going to work. My first thing is like I'm like, well, we're remote working at the moment, and you don't know the passwords. And then I'm like, even if you found the building and we weren't. You got to work out what key it is. <laughs> like, you know yeah, I mean? like exactly. So, like the ac- an actual body swap story would be deeply boring because it'd be two people not really sure how the other one's life works. You know, yeah, yeah, and, and, and not in a like if you body swap with a celebrity, you've got you've got access to to, right. to things. Like I don't know, you know. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think it maybe is more interesting if you also get like some of their knowledge do you know what i mean like maybe right. or i don't yeah, know yeah yeah so, like, so you you're still you but you you cuz you're in their body now you know the basics of what their life is in, in, what situation it's in so you you I, I would just know what key to use to get into your office building and i i'd vaguely understand what your job is uh, because I genuinely still don't. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you're, you're, Chris, you're a trans monster. It's fine. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you, maybe. But, but like, I, I, you know, I, I, I would gain a, a certain amount of like surface level knowledge from being in your body with, I guess, what's physically your brain, even if it's my consciousness. I think to truly take advantage of a body swap, yeah. your your life, uh, the most interesting version of it is your life has to be so drastically diff- different either you know m- male to female female to male or whatever or a different country or a different uh wealth or a different status like i think right. in the w- in all the things that would make a body swap interesting <laughs> you and i live similar enough lives <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um so yeah i think i good, think good it question. just it, i just chill out i guess actually like you know it's not um it's not harming my body to go on a binge so maybe i just, maybe i just eat a lot or something in dad's body <laughs> just let him deal with the consequences um yeah we swap we more... swap back the next day and i wake up to a text from you that's like good luck <laughs> like but this is how like this is how like this is how this is how my brain works i'm trying to think of things like i say like it's about access so genuinely but obviously i don't really know I only know what I've got that you don't have. And in my head, I'm like, well, if Dan was me for a day, he could check out BritBox. <laughs> <laughs> what a boring answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a BritBox subscription, so I'd have a look at the UI, see what's on there. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, that is the kind of shit that we would actually do. <laughs> right, 100% I, 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 it is. It's, so, it's you... such a boring answer. It's be respectful and have a look at BritBox. <laughs> Exactly. Oh dear. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Right. So yeah. Good question. Dan's a thank bit you. More... Thank you, Punkfish. It's a good, it's a good one. Dan's. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not confirming or denying anything here. 
But out of the two of us, I think it would probably be obvious to regular listeners that um, Dan would be a bit more, a bit, a bit more bold of uh, of um, getting things from the internet. Maybe I'm not saying he does or doesn't, you know, ever download mm-hmm. anything, you know, torrent anything. But I'm saying out of the two of us, Dan's probably more skilled to do it and probably has the the access to it. So I think, you know, the answer is very simple here. If Dan was in my body, he'd avoid looking at my penis, he'd tell everyone, and he'd check out BritBox. And if I was in Dan's body, I'd avoid looking at his penis, I'd tell everyone, and I'd do some downloading. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're the dullest people. If you, uh, to extend the question slightly more then, you mentioned like, oh, what would be more interesting, maybe it'd be a celebrity body swap. Which celebrity are you, are you, are you going for? Um... Oh, I don't know. It's a good question, isn't it? I thought I just thought that off the top of my head, Chris. I I should I should be a listener. I, <laughs> probably. I do subscribe to our Patreon. Um, the, I think. Oh yeah, you are a patron for some reason. Yeah, I remember this. You get you're giving us a dollar a month. <laughs> you've got to go again. It feels like a slightly boring answer because obviously there's the answers of you'd live. There's like the fun answers. Like, do you know what I mean? I'd be like. I'd be Chris Hemsworth to find out what it was like to be that sexy. I'd be, you know, someone, a childhood crush to find out what their life was like. I, You know, you'd be someone who has this amazing, interesting, uh, adventurous life to find out what that was like. But honestly, my first instinct is Kevin Feige and just try and wander around and learn the secrets. <laughs> oh, I see. That's a good thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Become like, become someone who's making a thing that you'd like that you want the you know you want the you know you want foreknowledge on yeah yeah that yeah, i just i just yeah because I like yeah, because presumably doc, there's a, there's currently a cut of doctor strange and the multiverse of madness out there yeah exactly it's that it's, you'd, be, probably... you'd, be, you'd, you'd go kevin feige and then watch that presumably or kevin feige just like wander kevin feige and wander into the meeting where they're they're talking about a casting choice or pitching, you know, the second series of a show and just say something insane because apparently Kevin Feige does that. Like Kevin Feige just wandered into the Civil Wars right his room and was like, "Have Spider Man," and fucked off <laughs> and like do do stuff like that. Maybe um, I think that's I don't know for sure if it'd be Feige. I think it probably would, um, but yeah, it would be it would be something like that or maybe like <laughs> I don't I don't read the books. I didn't particularly watch the show. But wouldn't it be fascinating to be George R. R. Martin and just find out how much of the later books he's actually got? <laughs> like, go on his computer <laughs> and search, and search for the file that says book six or whatever it is. Yeah, I guess. What I about guess, you? Yeah, I will. I see. Now you've put the idea in my head of having control over something or the ability to check in or something. I guess I would. I guess I'd put myself into like, like into into Boris Johnson and like just reveal everything and like. It, and it would also yeah. like, ruin his career. <laughs> yeah, or say, or yeah, say something that. I mean, at this point, or I use don't know his, what, or use or, his power to do something fucking good. Yeah, but yeah, no, but then they've got excuse. Or you use, you use his power to to have him do or say something that is truly indefensible. But unfortunately, at this stage, I don't know what is. We're currently in a situation where he's hired an external party <laughs> to find out whether he was at a party. <laughs> like, it's, and, and I, don't, I know that's being pointed out by a lot of people, but I don't think enough people are talking about how fucking insane that is. <laughs> well, I th- I, if, honest, I, uh, I, I, honestly, I think this is all just a massive and like negative indictment on the British public. If this is what we care about over all the fucking horrendous choices he's made, th- one of the most dangerous incompetent governments of my, of my lifetime have made horrible decisions that have literally ruined lives if this fucking party is what brings his government down then i have lost all yeah, faith but for in me the it's not it's, the british it, public it's yeah and i suppose just to clarify for me it's not the action or or the incident for me it's what that represents it's the somehow we're just allowing to happen someone to hire a third party person that they're hiring and work with to answer the question of their own whereabouts yeah. and that's that's happening and it's what it's it's the fact that that insanity and madness 
is actually happening and isn't a spoof storyline in the thick of it in which you'd go, well, I don't buy that that would ever happen. Like, it's what it represents. So it's more, it's not so much, was he at the party that I care about? It's the the process is so fucked that that's how it can be investigated <laughs> and that's mm. allowed to happen. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, what that means for what else is presumably allowed to happen is the is the mad thing for me. Mm. Yeah, I, I and I think, you know, I think this conversation is going to lead to... Just, we just get so political. We just want to talk about avatars. Was everything going to be so political? <laughs> it's my new character, guy who thinks everything is pretty political and hates it. <laughs> but I tell you, though, you know, out of the two of us, Kevin Feige, Boris Johnson, I reckon I'm having the better day. <laughs> oh, you're having the better day. Who's who's achieving more with their day? But it depends if I can get, you know. The cast I want for the Fantastic Four. I don't know. Oh, you Obviously, you, you, you want to get the cheap. cast you want? Do you? You're gonna you're gonna give us a you're gonna give us a diverse cast, are you? Oh, it's always so political with you, Chris. You you are right. I suppose again, it's we've managed to we even with this version of the question, we've got round to the boring answer. But you are <laughs> right. The correct answer is to yeah. be in the body of someone in power and do something good. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it's annoying, yeah. but it's the it's the answer, isn't it? It's just like yeah. you know, could I could I you know, um, put my brain into like some top tier Hollywood celebrity and have the fucking craziest day of my life, private jet to an amazing party, or you know, just blow all of his money on something insane, like you know, I, uh, it's that's that's you know that's a hundred percent. You know, like the the temptation and the fun thing to do, but you know, if I'm only getting one shot at that, I'd like to maybe bring down a government <laughs> while I'm at it. That yeah, or, fun. or or like or useful. Be 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 Bezos and give all the money away. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, to myself mostly, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you want to give the money to all these charities and medical research groups, and then two million to Dan Doolan. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, <laughs> Jeff, uh, but head, headlines, breaking news: uh, Jeff Bezos has just given away all of his fortune. Ninety-nine um, percent of it is, of course, going to charities. We, we are we are currently uh, circling our helicopter on the ho- home of one Daniel Doolan, who has apparently also re- received a rather large sum of money, and we're unsure why. <laughs> and, and, uh, we, ha- wait, wait, we, ha- we have an interview with Daniel Doolan now. He's coming out of his house. Uh, I, uh, guys, I swear it's me, Jeff Bezos. I'm in his body. I don't know what's happened. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. Because presumably, Bezos is you. <laughs> and at first, it was fun, and I told his girlfriend to get me a sandwich. But now I'm like, <laughs> now I'm lost. No, I wouldn't. Because the thing is, that's the kind of thing. If it's only for a day, that's getting re- that's getting reversed. Do you know what I mean? That kind of thing. So maybe yeah. if you would beat Bezos, you'd I'd wrote I'd write a comeback song to Bo Burnham. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just Jeffrey Bezos going Bo Burnham. Bo <laughs> oh, yeah, Burnham. that's fun. Um, yeah. Anyway, so well, yeah. The thing is, you can't undo that. Though you can't come back the, one day later and be like, right, I wasn't myself yesterday. All that money I just gave to all those charities. I'm taking it back. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's true, I suppose. Yeah, but that's what I mean. These people are PR bulletproof, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that was a fun fun time. Thank you for the question, Punkfish. That led to a led to a lot of, admittedly, not very Avatar based, but certainly a fun discussion. And I'm, I'm uh, yeah, uh, but that's you know, that's the gamble are... of listeners' questions. That is the gamble of listeners' questions. But yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Um, as always, you can send us your thoughts. What would you do if you could jump into a very celebrity's body, or what would you do if you were if you were either me or Chris for a day? <laughs> that could be fun. Uh, you can let us know at mail at nothingbutstatic.co.uk, or you can tweet at us at Dan Doolin, at C Billingham, or if you join the Patreon uh, from patreon.com slash nothingbutstatic, you can get on the Discord and let us know there. That's That could be fun. Or in the YouTube comments for this episode. Another great place to... Share your thoughts on what you do with that with with that with that extraordinary power. Um, obviously, also thoughts on this episode of Avatar, which we both very much enjoyed and did talk about for a good forty five minutes before we let ourselves get completely yeah, engulfed fine. with this nonsense. Uh, 
So I feel yeah. at least reasonably comfortable that, you know, we tangented at the end. That's the best time to do it. So if you're not into it, you could just switch off. <laughs> like, that's fine. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, obviously, go, uh, go support Raffo Draws. Uh, Raffo spelled R A P H O. Um, Instagram.com slash Raffo Draws or launchlinks.io slash you slash Raffo Draws. Raffo supplies that artwork of Appa in front of the sunset that we use. Um, and it's brilliant. And you should support Raffo. Raffo's done like graphic novels and other stuff you can get, like various pieces of art based on all sorts of stuff and original stuff as well. And it's available on t shirts and mugs and stuff. Um, go support. Go support a really cool artist who is very nice about letting us uh, use their work. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Uh, mm-hmm. It's brilliant artwork, and you should uh, you should check out the the Instagram. Hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. Um, I think that's everything, though, Chris. Have we done it? Yeah, man. We've done yeah, it again. We're done. Yeah. I am always a little too surprised to find we've done a podcast when we get to the end of a podcast, aren't I? <laughs> you are consistently, as we established last week, nearly a thousand episodes. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, you're I like, need to work shit, out the man. actual number. That would be a fun thing to figure out. Um, but anyway, yeah, but it's whether you count the unaired pilot, the random two-hour episode we did on religion and never released. <laughs> like... oh, I forgot that exists. Well, it doesn't anymore. I imagine I can't know even if I've still got those files. But yeah, no, I yeah, think cause... you were very determined they should never see the light of day, so deleted both of those things. Yeah, because well, there was also the the one the one about books that we didn't release. What? <laughs> So that. we did it. We did a thing for the Patreon where we recorded our thoughts or like our favorite books, recommended books, <laughs> and it was only like an hour. Dude. But the problem was, we did it, and I talked a lot about Audible in it because I'd say it was saying like some of these books. When I go back to them, I, whenever I read a book the first time, I like to read it, you know, in my hands, read it. But I a second time experiencing a book, I do sometimes enjoy the audio version because. I can do it while I'm commuting. You know, it's a great way to re-experience a book without having to commit the time to it, you know. Um, so I talked a fair bit, I think I talked a fair bit about audiobooks as well. But then we got that sponsorship from Audible and it all felt very dirty to put that on the Patreon when it's accidentally an Audible advert. Right, yeah. You know, because yeah. it, and, it, and we'd recorded it pre the Audible deal. Really, I should put it, I, if, I, if it's still somewhere, I could put it up now, I guess. But another lost episode, of course, is when we reviewed... Uh, the, the 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 first Dalek episode of Jodie's time as the as the Doctor Revolution, I think it was called. Revolution yes. of the Daleks, and then we recorded a review of it, and it was just such a miserable. We hated this review, and I just hated watching it. I hated reviewing it, and then I literally just forgot about it to the point when it was like, well, there's no point in me even putting this out at this point now. <laughs> Yeah, and you. I'm so glad, because at the time I was like, is that the right decision? Like, in general, for us to stop doing it. And I hear I hear the creators that have powered through reviewing this era, <laughs> despite not liking it. And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad this isn't us. <laughs> yeah, I'll be interested to see what we did, what we do when Russell comes in, if we, if we decide to go back to reviewing Doctor Who episodes or not. But we shall see. We shall see. Um, but yeah, yeah so yeah, there's a, so it would be hard to count the exact number because we've, as we've just discovered, there's a bunch of unreleased episodes that will never see the light of day. Um, you know, uh, yeah. So it is yeah. what it is. Good times. But yeah, thanks everyone for listening. I've been Dan Doolan. I've been Chris Billingham, and we'll see you next time when we sit down to watch Nightmares and Daydreams. <laughs> <laughs>